the wrath of Elihu. Last week we learned that Job was able to look through the misfortunes of his life and have hope. One would say that his friends have reconsidered their statements too and have embraced his suffering so. But unfortunately it cannot be further from the truth. This week we are being presented with another advisor of Job and his name is Elihu, man with a solid resume but with one distinctive difference. He was younger than the other three. Let's see what this new guy is bringing in, but it seems that things are escalating. The mm -hmm. title suggests some anger, wrath. And as the lesson points out at the beginning, what happened with Job's friends throughout the written story was simply a verbal sparing, meaning that there were a lot of words spoken, but no hope and no healing and comfort offered. Mm -hmm. Intentions were right. Knowledge was valuable, but message, the message was fruitless. Isn't that a great example of how sometimes we might be full of knowledge and experience, but we fall short on what is the best way to apply all of that? Hmm. Immediately in my mind came alive multitudes of debates, discussions, where both sides have their minds set repeat the same arguments over and over again and it's not so much to convince the other party but like to convince ourselves that we are right. Another picture is also very vivid in my mind. This allegory of three groups of blind people that were brought to an elephant and some were positioned next to his feet, some next to his tail and the others had to touch his trunk. Then they were asked to describe what an elephant is. Just imagine the debate. It would have been very funny if it wasn't so serious for Job. And if there wasn't this injustice and judgment. I want to echo the appeal of the author. We need humility. We have started this quarterly with a whole lesson dedicated on how we can put ourselves in Job's position so that we can relate to his calamity to the best of our ability. And since then, I have been asking myself the question, what is the best way to relate to somebody that I can relate to somebody who is suffering? And also, I've been hoping that I would learn something from Job's friends of how this job is done. Wrong. I've been wrong all along because till chapter 31 nothing that Eliphaz, Bildad or Zophar said contributed to that. Moreover, chapter 33 brings it to another whole new level of friendship that I cannot accept. Elihu is angry. After listening for so long, he's angry. He's angry at the three, he's angry at Job. Oops, <laughs> did I use angry four times? Not you, but Job 32, 1 to 5 uses wrath and anger four times to describe the escalation in Elihu. In such discussions, it's easy to get into such state. Now, I think that the lesson is getting into something very important here. Why was Elihu angry? Yes, one of the reasons why Elihu was angry with Job was because he thought that Job justified himself rather than God. Something was furious, furiously burning in his mind. He took it personally and started defending God. And I'm trying to reason that kind of behavior. One should be very close to God to be so sensitive so that a reaction like that can come out of him. At the same time, I'm asking myself, wasn't Elihu a close friend of Job too? How come he was not a strong defender of Job Two, something was wrong. Hmm. Well, the point that the lesson is bringing in here is about fear. The fear that God is not what they think him to be. This is big and is very important for us to understand. Many of us don't take change very well. We believe in certain ways and this is the foundation of our existence. But what if things were ended up to be a bit different? 
Did I believe a lie? For many, this will make everything to tumble down. Their life will be destroyed. And this fear can take us to strange places in attempt to defend our stability. We may think that we defend God. We may pretend to want to help Job. But all that we do, in fact, is to protect our world. We go, we go on with our lives and since we're small, we're taught how to solve problems. It's in our nature. We take what's given, of course, proven facts and truths, and we plug them in in an equation which is also proven, and voila, the result sprout by itself. But what happens when unfamiliar, unknown, unproven variable is plugged in in the same equation? <laughs> the good and proven equation is not able to produce the right answer, the right result anymore. Sin and evil, and suffering for that matter, are not known variables for us. We are under their control, not the opposite. So we can't explain them. The author, working with some quotes from Ellen White, says that if we can explain evil, we will give it an excuse and a reason to exist. And by this, it will cease to be evil. We put ourselves in great danger when we try to rationally explain everything. It doesn't mean that we should trust and believe things blindly, but we have to be conscious that for many things, we don't know much. We know more than Job for certain things. We know about this controversy between good and evil that is being played in the background, but even with this, many questions remain unanswered. Some of these questions are being rightfully voiced even under some of our videos on these lessons in Facebook. Job's desire to be good, in fact, is what got him into trouble. <laughs> he didn't volunteer to be the guinea pig. Was it fair for all those people that died? And at the end, what difference did it make? Was it all worth it? The lesson calls this last part the challenge of faith. Faith is about things that we don't see, things that are experienced on a different level. It doesn't have to make sense, but you can trust. Then in conclusion, when faced with suffering, shouldn't I be perfectly fine with the answer, this doesn't make sense, <laughs> period. I wouldn't put the period. The study is not done yet. We have four more lessons and hopefully there will be more things for us to add to the picture. Okay, so just then join us next week to see if we can get out of the whirlwind. Mm.